So today we'd like to talk to you about diffusion weighted imaging and microstructure imaging. And the reason why we are interested in microstructure imaging is because if you think of it, most modalities that we use to scan the brains are scalar. So they are MRI and CD scans and they give us information about the structures of the brain. And I like to think of those as being the maps of the neighborhood in a city. So for example, in New York, we would see Central Park and we would see Chelsea, but we would not have no idea how to get from one place to another. And for that, we would need to know about the roads and how they connect to one another. And likewise, in the brain imaging community, people have been increasingly interested in mapping the connections of the brain. So those are the wires that connect cortical areas to one another. But going a bit further than that, actually we may be interested to know more than just the names of the streets and how they connect to one another. We may be interested to know where we can actually cycle or bike, or whether there's any metro lines that we can use instead of for cars, or maybe if there is any work on the streets that, or that we would have to avoid in order to get from one place to another faster. All of those information would be very valuable if I was to travel in that city. Now the same applies to the brain connectivity. The brain, when we think about the brain connectivity, we usually think about the axons. Those are the wires of the brain that connect areas to one another. But those axons would not work so well if they were not covered by a myelin sheath. And that myelin sheath is sort of a fatty coat, if you want, that covers the axons and makes the transmission of signal along those axons faster. And this myelin is actually produced by a type of cells called oligodendrocytes, and uh, along those oligodendrocytes is astrocytes. Those astrocytes are commonly thought of as being the supporting cells of the brain, and uh, there is also microglia, and uh, those cells actually are thought of as being the garbage collectors of the brain, and they are here to uh, collect the debris when there's been axonal axonal injury, for example, we'll talk about that later. Now, I should note here that although we, we, we associate astrocytes and microglia as having sort of mundane role in the brain, they actually have much, much more important functions and they are involved in uh, things like memory, for example. So being able to map the microstructure of the brain and the astrocytes and the microglia and, and the axons and the myelin is actually very important in order to, under to better understand neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders, as well as normal development, for example. So how can we actually map the microstructure? How can we perform microstructure imaging? It turns out that we can use diffusion-weighted imaging for that. And, and here I should make clear that diffusion, we call diffusion-weighted imaging those images that come directly from the MRI scanners, maybe they be provided by a radiographer or radiologist, for example. And we use those images that are scattered by nature to in, in, to estimate a model of the microstructure. So the, the microstructure imaging is not really an image as such as it is a model. But let's move on, and I like to think about diffusion-weighted imaging as, 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 as having a box filled with, uh, filled with marbles. And so if you, if you close that box and you, and you start shuffling and shaking that box in left and right and uh, up and down, well, you will hear some kind of very loud sounds as the marbles sort of hit and bounce against one another. Now imagine that I ask you to close your eyes and, uh, and open the box and, uh, and secretly insert some strips in it and then close the box again and, uh, and ask you to open your eyes and, uh, and to shake the box. Well, if you shake it left and right, you will probably hear the same sound as before as the uh, marbles are hitting one another. But if you start shaking it up and down, you will hear some kind of dull sound as, as the, uh, the, the marbles can't actually, can't actually cross those, those strips that I, that I, that I inserted. So the interesting, the interesting thing here is that even though you didn't know that I inserted those, those uh, strips, you can have some information about them just by listening to the sound that the box makes when you shake it left and right and up and down. Now, it could be a bit more tricky and I could insert some more complex uh, structure, like such as a cup, for example, somewhere, and then some bending strips, maybe, and, uh, and, and hand it back to you. And then you, you may want to shake it in very many different directions and maybe a bit harder for you to, to figure out what's in the box, but I'm pretty sure that you would be able to figure it out in the end, maybe using math or computer, for example. No, we don't really have, and uh, quite fortunately, I guess, uh, marbles in our head, but we do have a lot of water molecules, and those water molecules don't have to be shaken to move, they move all the time. And they are absolutely everywhere, and when I say everywhere, I literally mean it. They are in the cells, outside the cells, in all of the cells, they are circulating, they are moving all the time, they are everywhere. 
And now imagine that I open your brain and I start painting the um, the water molecules one by one in your brain. Now I don't do that randomly. I do that in a very specific pattern, uh, which follows uh, what we would call an encoding orientation of left to right. So I, I color the left one uh, blue and the right one red, and then everything in between, in between blue and red. Now if I let those water molecules diffuse and if they are in a region of the brain where they can diffuse really freely and I open your brain a little a little a little later uh, then I would I would probably see that I have lost the pattern yeah, there's going to be water molecules that are red that are on the left and water molecules that are right that are blue that are on the right and so that indicates that the water molecules were actually indeed able to diffuse in that direction now imagine that I'm actually um, uh, in an area of the brain where the water molecules are, are sort of restricted and they can't really diffuse left and right because there are some strips or some axons maybe uh, that prevent them from moving. If I do that and if I let them diffuse for a while, then I, and if I open the brain again and look at the color of the water molecules that I see, I would see that the pattern is not altered so much as it was before. And that the, the point here is that even though I, do, I may not know nothing about the I may know nothing about the, um, the the presence of the strips and the barriers to diffusion of water molecules, by just looking at the colors of the water molecules after they diffuse, I can have an information about the direction of those barriers. And so the opposite uh, situation to the to the one before is if the uh, the uh, the strips were actually parallel to the encoding orientation, and in that case, if I was to let the water molecules diffuse, I would again lose the pattern of the colors. And so the important message here is that if the water molecules are free to move, uh, then I lose the pattern. If they are not free to move, then I don't lose the pattern. That's exactly what's happening in diffusion weighted imaging. So of course the uh, water molecules don't really have a color and it would be painful and uh, probably take a lifetime to color them one by one. But what they do have however is a precession and so it's kind of a fancy name and you don't need to know much about it if you want to understand microstructure imaging. The only thing you really want to know is that this is a magnetic property of the protons of the water molecules and those can be uh, altered by um, by the magnet in the MRI. So, so think about the precession really as the as the color of the water molecules. Now I can I can sort of um, select the gradient, so the orientation in which I will color those water molecules, and I could I could select that left and right, up and down, or any direction really. Uh, and then there's other things that I can, the other choices that I can make when I acquire my diffusion weighted images, uh, such as how long time I leave the water molecules to diffuse before I open the brain to see their color. Or, or what's the uh, what's the spatial frequency I use for the uh, color change? So should I color the, uh, the one molecule blue and then the next one directly red, or should I should I color the next one maybe uh, light blue and then and then light yellow and then orange and progressively to red? So those are properties that I I need to uh, to to decide upon as well. Uh, but one good thing about uh, microstructure imaging, and in most models, uh, the, actually the, the majority of models that we use so far, uh, all of those properties can be summarized into a single B value that sort of summarizes this time of diffusion of water molecules and the gradient strength, etc. Et now, how do we move from those diffusion weighted images, which are scalar images, to a model of the microstructure? Well, it turns out that if I know the microstructure, and if I know the B value, and if I know the gradient orientation, then I can tell, or I can I can model, and I can I can estimate or or predict what the signal is going to be. That is like predicting the sound that the box is going to make if I know what's in the box. So if I know that, and I know that for different uh, values of the parameters of the microstructure, then by uh, by acquiring diffusion imaging with different B values and different gradient orientation, then I may be able to actually estimate the values of those parameters at every voxels of the brain. And that would be that would be very helpful. Now you may say, well, how are you going to do going to do that? There's there's lots of combinations of parameters that we can use. There can, can be different glial cells and different the different axons of different orientations. So how are you going to do that? Well, it turns out that there is a great property of the diffusion signal, which is called the uh, superposition property. And it turns out that with that property, everything everything becomes becomes much easier. Uh, because if, if I have two compartments of water molecules, and I know one model for each of them, then the if the both compartments actually present together in a voxel, then the signal that arises from both of them is, is the sum of the signals. And there's an extra parameter here, which is the, the fractions f1 and f2, and those are the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, 
sort of number of water molecules in each compartment. So they are proportional to the number of water molecules in each compartment. So, so for instance, I could have a, a compartment that represents this, this, this red cup and then I have another component that, that may represent the compartment of the uh, bandit uh, yellow strip. And so it makes things easier because all we need to do is to have a model for the building blocks of the microstructure and not for every combination of microstructure. And so that's exactly what we can do. So we can have a model for the diffusion of water molecules in axons, for example. And in axons, water molecules are free to move uh, um, along the direction of the axons, but they are quite restricted to move um, in the direction orth orthogonal to it. So it's, it's like uh, it's like the the strips in the in the box of marbles. And so we would represent that with an ellipsoid that uh, that's uh, much elongated in the direction of the axons, and then sort of uh, and sort of. Uh, uh, tight in the uh, direction orthogonal to it. Now we can do uh, the same type of modeling for the microglia and uh, because in the water microglia the water molecules are very restricted we would have a small circle you know, or a small small sphere I should say instead of a, instead of a long ellipsoid. We can do that uh, as well for the interstitium so the uh, water molecules outside of the axons but nearby it and those would be uh, influenced by the by the axon because they would they would sort of bounce against it uh, every now and then and this is called the hindered diffusion so we could have a model for that as well uh, it would be a bit larger than the model for the axons because the uh, water molecules can diffuse a bit more easy uh, orthogonal to it and then we could also have a model for the free space and the free space occurs for example in the CSF where the uh, water molecules can diffuse really freely and those would be uh, the, the, the diffusion process there would be represented by a large ball because because water molecules can diffuse in all directions. And so because of that nice properties I was telling you a bit uh, about earlier, uh, we can have a model of the complex microstructure by just adding the building blocks of each sim simple compartment. This is sometimes called diffusion compartment imaging uh, since we are using different models for diff different compartments. And uh, as I said, there's also a bunch of fractions that we have to uh, estimate, and uh, those represent the number of water molecules in each compartment. So the great thing here is that we moved from sort of a boring black and, black and white or grayscale image of the brain to something more complex, which is a microstructure image. And that microstructure image contains at every voxel an entire model of the microstructure that's present at that location in the brain. And with that, we're actually moving from a neighborhood map to a map that contains a lot more information about the brain. And, and using that, we can actually uh, answer questions such as uh, what's happening if there is a dead road in the brain. So that road uh, occurs, for example, if there is, if there is um, a, an axonal loss. So that occurs in a, in a trauma, for example, or, or in aging. Um, and and, if, and that's, if that's the case, then water molecules can't really diffuse, if you think about it, uh, along the direction of the axons as much as it could before the uh, axon allus. And there's also more microglia, because as I said before, the microglia is, uh, is the garbage collector. So there's going to be lots of garbage to collect here because the, uh, the axon is lost. And so there's lots of uh, cell debris. Uh, so there's going to be more microglia, I would assume, and, uh, and maybe maybe less diffusion along the axon. So uh, maybe the, the model is going to be to present with a, a diffusion that's lower along the direction of the axon. So the dark blue ellipsoid here and the fraction, so the red strip uh, is going to be larger because the fraction of, water, of, of microglia, water molecules in microglia is going to be larger simply because there's more microglia in that voxel. So I should say that this is all, this is all speculative here uh, uh, because, because we don't really know how it affects the, uh, the model of the microstructure and this is, this is much ongoing research. But I, I think it's, it's a very exciting exciting research and I hope you are just as enthusiastic as I am about this research because it really tell, gives us details and, and information about the cellular processes occurring in neurological diseases and in psychiatric disorders.